Hi there, John Flores again. I know, I know, I promised I was through with my YouTube site altogether. But for goodness sakes, we've been in lockdown or the state's barely opening up and all of that. And I'm at home and I'm bored, so I thought I'd check in and say hello. If you guys want to let me know how you're doing, post it to the site. I hope you're all safe and well. The funny thing is, is that I did this particular clip. I did a version of it yesterday, but I had brand new computer equipment and failed to check the microphone jack. So I did about a half hour, virtually nonstop, with no sound. So, as they say in my business, take two. Okay, this is not an epiphany, but it certainly is an inside the business look at an outdated profession, which was a &R representative or a &R man, artist and repertoire. That's what I was when RCA hired me in 1968 and I was there through 1970. And then I did the same function for Bell Records after that through 1973. That was, and I didn't know it at the time, a dinosaur job function that was going to be replaced by independent producers all across the country. But for decades, the A&R man at all of the major labels, the A&R man was responsible for a whole host of duties, so to speak, that were not required of independent producers. A&R men had been responsible for most of the music produced in the nation at the time. You had staff producers like Rick Gerard next to me at RCA, who was famous for the Jefferson Airplane at that time, uh, Feliciano, Nilsson, and more, John Hartford, and more. You had Jack Please, who was doing the uh, middle of the road artists, and Joe Reisman, my boss, who did the orchestral people like Mancini and Hugo Montenegro. And then you had Daryl Rice, who soon retired, who was doing kind of religious music. When Daryl Rice retired and got his watch, his cold watch, after 25 years of working for RCA, I thought, whoa, that's going to be me. Wrong. What happened was this was kind of a dying breed, the a &R man, and it continued beautifully in, oh, I don't know, a couple of years later at Warner Brothers Records. And my parallel with this is kind of, I, I don't know, it humors me a lot, is, is like Warner Brothers Records was like SAE, the fraternity uh, at Arizona State University where I pledge Sigma Chi. SAE was kind of the elite. And uh, in fact, all of them looked like they belonged on the either the golf course or on the cover of GQ. And they had an, an elite attitude to them because they knew they were elite. And I was never elite, so I didn't fit in there. And that's why I had pledged Sigma Chi. Though, in my heart of hearts, I never should have pledged anything because I really wasn't kind of the, hey, how you doing kind of fraternity guy. But, okay, Warner Brothers was SAE. That became the elite elite. And those of us at the major labels like RCA, Columbia, Capital, and others began to kind of fade into the woodwork as the independent producers began to take over much of the business. So in, in looking back, my biggest mistake, or maybe, I don't know what you want to call it, a mistake, but, or even regret, is that I didn't have the brains that David Kirschenbaum had, the world famous producer, who came to work at RCA a couple years after I had left and became staff there. He did B.W. Stevenson's My Maria, and then eventually, uh, I mean, gosh, his, his star is on the Hollywood Walk of Fame as a record producer. The man is absolutely brilliant. But what he did as a wise career move when he left RCA Records was he decided to go staff another staff position, but this time as head of A&R for A&M Records. Okay, now administratively, I wouldn't have liked that job whatsoever, being the head of A&R, but it also allowed him to produce, and he did Joan Baez and several others, and it fit his personality beautifully because he, like me, was not really a master politician. He was just a music guy. 
And we've chatted in the past year, and it was just wonderful to catch up. And he told me some stories that I won't repeat, but they are fantastic. And the man is a professional's professional. Okay. But the main thing, as I've told you before, is that I was no good at schmoozing. I didn't do drugs. I didn't go out and do the things associated with being an independent producer, which was deal making and giving away parts of my publishing and all kinds of wheeling and dealing. I didn't do any of that. If you uh, look at any David Foster interviews that are on video, you're going to see that he's a master politician as well as a master producer. He's maybe the finest producer of my generation based on the amount of hits the diversity of the acts uh, and, and just his overall incredible masterful skills in all areas from orchestration songwriting production on and on and on and on and on but he had the skills or street skills as i would think of them that david kirschenbaum and i weren't all that great at okay so what i'd really like to just get into rather quickly is what an a and r man was as opposed to what an independent producer was you see an a and r man is something like let's say a home builder and that builder is responsible for all these elements all the way down to the finished home an independent producer didn't have to do some of the functions that we as a and r people had to do okay for instance we had to be open to the street that means we had offices at our parent companies which independent producers didn't have they worked out of their home or their offices but rca you could in those days walk in cold up the street no appointment and say, can I get an appointment with John Flores, the producer? And I happened to be walking by one day and they said, well, we'll set up an appointment for you. And I said, no, nah, let him come on back. And it was a guy who had a group called the Midday Rain in the Pacific Northwest. And he had driven straight down to try to get to see me. And I was uh, flattered, but I, I liked what he did and I signed him on the spot. He walked in the door cold no appointment no announcement just said i wonder if i can see john okay so i also had appointments with people who did contact us through either our reception or via mail or you know, other telephone appointments that were either through friends that were directed to me i also had to meet regularly at my office with what were called song pluggers and those are the guys who worked for major publishing houses and some smaller publishing houses that were going around town shopping the tunes that their company wanted to promote at the time. So they didn't even have to know who you were producing, though they did, but they would bring whatever their hottest tunes were that they were allowed to show you. Now they weren't allowed to show you the ones that were kind of already on hold or specifically written for huge artists at the time. You, you weren't allowed to see those unless you were friends with these guys that they would show it to you on the side saying, you could hear it, but you can't have it, John. So I had regular appointments with these guys from all these companies uh, on a weekly basis at my office. Okay. Further, artists didn't just walk in the door. Artists mailed in their stuff. And, uh, and or if an attorney, a manager, an agent had an act that they were representing, they might messenger a product over. Usually in those days it was acetates before cassettes, but cassettes became popular. So I was responsible for hearing everything that came into the label from aspiring artists. And that was quite a job. I mean, you had a lot of stuff to go through and you had to get back to all of them. Okay, you couldn't just throw it in the dumpster and not get back. You had to say, yeah, I love this. Can we talk some more? No, I don't like this, whatever. And usually those were done in letter form other than the local ones where you could make a call to the manager, agent, attorney, et cetera, and say, I'm going to take it or going to pass. But that took up an enormous amount of time, just like it did meeting with the song pluggers from the publishing companies. 
Okay, on top of that, of course, you had uh, all kinds of phone calls coming in to RCA that were routed to you when the front desk couldn't answer those questions. So I had a phone job of sorts as well. So I was doing all these functions. This A&R means artist and repertoire. So you're basically dealing with the artist and repertoire, but with a whole bunch of clerical functions as well. Okay, so then in my case at RCA, I was able to produce whoever I wanted. That's kind of rare in those days. Often you were assigned who the label wanted you to produce. For instance, Ray Cork, who came in to take Rick Gerard's place, he was assigned Zager and Evans that had the big hit record in the year 2525, and he was assigned Jack Jones. Jack Please came in to do Middle of the Road, and he was assigned the Middle of the Road roster of, of primarily singers. Okay, but I was allowed to do my own thing. Doing my own thing meant that I either had to accept one of these artists that was submitted to the label, or I had to go out and find them. And that meant going to clubs all the time. So in the day, I'm doing all these administrative functions, and at night, I'm going out to clubs. Well, at the time, in 1968, there was a big act in LA, very famous in LA, called The Mob, and it was a horn-based group. And I thought it was too much like Chicago, the group Chicago. And so I passed and it took me a couple of months until I found the Friends of Distinction at a little nightclub called The Daisy in Beverly Hills. And uh, oh, thank you God that they decided to sign with a rookie like me because they didn't have to, but they did. Okay, so you get the act. Okay, either the act is submitted to you or you go out and you find one. Once you find it, then you need material. Well, Sometimes the group, in my case, I 90% of the time work with vocalists and vocal groups. So sometimes the act itself had access to material or wrote material themselves. Then I had this stack of things from the publishers, reps, the, the song pluggers. And then I had to announce that I was producing, say, the Friends of Distinction. And all those same guys would come by with tunes that were specifically intended for the Friends of Distinction to hear. Okay, so back to the office, many more appointments, hear that stuff, add it to it. And then initially sit around a sofa and a coffee table with the group itself and decide which ones we thought we might record. If we thought we might record those tunes, then we would go around the members of the group and see who wanted to sing which song and occasionally audition. Sometimes the two different people would want to take the lead on a song. And in my case, what I loved uh, with, that we did with the Friends of Distinction is often we stepped out people as well, usually on the album cuts, but we gave everybody a chance to, to have a line or two in songs. Okay, so then once you've got it down to the material you're gonna record, then you gotta get around the piano and rehearse them. And when you rehearse them, it's a really good idea to record or tape what you're rehearsing. And we did that with uh, the Grazing in the Grass album. At RCA, we went down to Studio C at RCA Studios, and we demoed the songs we were going to record, including Grazing in the Grass. My boss, Joe Reisman, came up and said, what's that song they're singing? That's, I, can it in your I said, I think that's their single. It's, it's, a, it's a lyrical rendition of the Hugh Masekela hit, Grazing in the Grass. Okay, once you've rehearsed it, you know whether you've set the tune in the right key, you have a basic idea of the tempo you're going to do, you're uh, aware of any strong spots and weak spots, and then you're set to go. So your next function is that you got to create a budget for the album. Well, I don't know that the independents had to do this. I assume that their secretaries or their administrators did it for them, or the label just gave them a budget. Not true with an a &R man. You had to specifically come up with the dollar amounts for rhythm players, orchestra sessions, studio costs, cartage, which was the bringing of instruments to the studio. All this stuff you had to do, and I did it uh, in collaboration with my wonderful secretary, Paula Spector. We, uh, we had a blast doing that, but I'm, I'm telling you, that was work. And then you submit the budget to the label, and the Friends of Distinction's budget for the Grayson album was $13,000, if you can believe that. 1968. And I remember a KHJ disc jockey saying, whoa, that going in circles, that's a huge orchestra. Well, it was two violins, one viola, 
and one cello. Oh my God, we had to play tricks in order to get these things to sound as big as they did. I recently saw on YouTube a session where Karen Carpenter did a sweetening date and her string section was bigger than my Johnny Mathis full orchestra session. That included brass and rhythm and whatever for Mathis. I mean, she had a lot of strings. Boy, I wish we'd had the budget for that, but we didn't. We had a $13,000 budget. Okay, then once you have the budget, you've already determined whether you're going to be using double scale players or not. Now, the string contractor, the head of the string section, uh, he always got double scale. If you hired a contractor to secure these musicians for you, and coordinate all those schedules and get them to show up for you, then that gentleman in those days for me was Ben Barrett and he got double scale. All of this is part of your budget. And then you might have a, a drummer that's double scale or uh, gosh, in the free to pain days, the whole rhythm section was double scale. That all plays in to your budget. Okay, but now you're ready to pick the musicians. And usually in my case, I had a first call drummer based on what style of material we were doing. And with the Friends of Distinction, that was Jim Gordon. Okay, we won't go any further than that other than to say he played on legendary stuff all the way across the board, all genres of music. And then Max Bennett on bass and Joe Sample on piano and on and on and on and on and on. You had to know the style of the people individually that you wanted on your product. Once you did, you called Ben Barrett and say, book them. And Rick Joy gave me a fabulous piece of advice back in those days, which I wish I had honored more often than I did. And he said, if you can't get your first call musicians, wait for them. Well, the label always gave you a deadline to meet and sometimes you couldn't wait for them. So you went with your second or third choices and I wish I had never done that. However, okay, now you got the musicians book. Now you got to book the room. Well, at RCA, SNA and our man, artist and repertoire man, we had no choice of working at outside studios. We had to work at RCA studios and there were only three of them in the building. And we had tons of artists on this label. Everybody from John Denver to Elvis to the Starship to Feliciano to Mancini to on and on and on. So you try booking one of those puppies because everybody else wants them too. And if you have a favorite room out of the three, which I did, Studio A, uh, good luck in getting that. My bad luck studio was Studio B, which looked identical. It was huge. There was a, a, a basketball or a symphony sized, gymnasium sized studios. But I would try to get Studio A. And then uh, eventually RCA made me choose between my two engineers. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to continue uh, switching them off, using one for something, one for another and whatever, because I loved them both but they made me choose, and so I choose Grover Helsley, my lifelong friend. Rest in peace, Grover. Wonderful job. So now you got the engineer set, you got the room set, you got the musicians called, you got the budget, you got the tunes, you got the arrangements. Now in this case, okay, Ray Cork, who was my buddy from Phoenix, he did the friends arrangements, and I had no input whatsoever because he was so brilliant that it would be far beyond anything I could have imagined. So in later days, yes, I had input into the arrangements but in those days, not. So Ray, for instance, on Grayson and the Brass, he had three different intros written for the Grazing and the Grass record. And his first choice of the three was the one that is now famous. It's been on commercials and uh, all kinds of stuff, which is da 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 Time to even give them a slightly unusual sound to them. So the next step for us was you take the rhythm section in with the group and the group is in an isolation booth. That's like a phone booth with a door on it. And they're in there so that the instruments don't leak into their, uh, what do you call it, their draft vocal track where they're just letting the musicians know what they're playing to. And uh, an aside on that is the only time that a vocal was used from that little phone booth, isolation booth, was on Johnny Mathis' single, You're As Right As Rain. He sang it one time with the orchestra. He sang it so perfectly that we left it alone and went with it. It was fabulous. We didn't have to go back in like we did with everybody else and redo these vocals. 
over and over again. Now, I will say on the Friends of Distinctions album, Grazing in the Grass was sung in one take. Can you imagine? I can dig it, he can dig it, she can dig it, we can dig it, they can dig it. Oh, let's dig it. Uh, really intricate arrangement, one take. Uh, it just absolutely blows my mind. Okay, and Eli's coming with Jessica Cleves and the group. Highly intricate arrangement. Go back and listen to it sometime. Eli's coming, the Laura Nero tune, Friends of Distinction. One take. Incredible talent, this group. Incredible talent. Clarence McDonald was their vocal arranger. And he stayed with them for the Grayson album and then left after that. And it broke my heart that he left. He was as brilliant in his area as Ray was in his. But Clarence went on to be a just top flight, not just studio pianist, but a ranger, conductor, and a multi-decade uh, career in the music business. What a, what a great talent Clarence McDonald is. Okay, so now you've done the rhythm track, then you're gonna start doing what they call sweetening. And when you go in and you sweeten, you can put in percussion, more guitar parts, uh, you can decide you want the group to do hand claps or maybe create a party behind it uh, so it sounds like it's live like we did with Light My Fire with the Friends Distinction. You do all kinds of stuff until you add it on kind of this gorp. <laughs> you just make it a little richer and fuller and maybe a few more tricks thrown in. And then you call in the studio orchestra and hopefully you do the strings separately from the brass. They can both be called for the same session, but you have the strings go in first so that the brass doesn't leak into the string microphone and then you bring in the brass same session and you have them play and now you've got everything ready to go mix and again as i will say for the millionth time i didn't give mixing the credit it was due for several years it took me several years to get my head on straight with that because if you go all the way back into the a and r function of all the administrative clerical and day job aspects and budgeting and then you get all these steps completed you go in and all i did was mix it the way they played it i thought okay here's the song we all like the song here's the way it was played we all like how it was played so here it is now several years later i use every trick in the book to make those mixes sound like they are just in your face competitive I mean, up a notch, up several notches. Not in those days. I was, what would you call it? I'm a long distance runner who feels like after the final mix is done, I've just crossed the finish line. And I didn't go back and really study whether I should redo those mixes or not. It was just the final shooter drop before handing the product over to the label. Once, as an A&R man for a major label that you finished the product, you have to take the tapes up, the finished mix tapes up to what's called the mastering room, which also was inside of RCA. You couldn't go an out, you, you could not go to an outside mastering firm. So this technician would take your tape and make whatever subtle changes you wanted and put it into acetate form. And once you approved that, your product went to the factory, was pressed, and then it went to sales and marketing. Oh, backtrack. You're also responsible for the album cover. I don't know if their independents did that or not. I assume independents and producers had some input into their covers, but we had to go from scratch and find a hot photographer. And we used Peter Worf a lot, which was, P Peter was the uh, Emmy, I'm sorry, the Grammy Award winner for that lady who was surrounded in whip cream her body was surrounded in whipped cream and it was called whipped cream and other delights herb alfred and the tijuana brass peter Wharf won the award that year we used him then i called him and i said introduced myself and said peter i'm john and we worked together for several years he and his wife Winnell were social friends of ours as well so okay you got the album and the disc and it all goes to the factory and then it gets given to sales and promotion now, as a staff producer, as an a and man, you have no say over anything from this point on. As an independent producer, you sure as hell do. You can decide whether you want to hire your own independent promotion to help get exposure for your product. You can't do that as an a and man. 
You just hand it over and they let you know whether they're able to do anything about it. Okay, later on in my career, I even had one gentleman who was highly connected who would tell me what chart position a certain record that I worked on would obtain on the country charts before radio ever heard it, before it was ever released. He said it'll go to number 23. It went to number 23. And as I've told you before, uh, promotion was a rather sticky area in terms of morality and legality and all of that. And frankly, I'm glad I did stay out of it. But as an A&R man, you just let the company have it. So sales and promotion went to work and they could decide whether to run ads in the trade papers like Billboard and others, or um, just send their guys out into the field and see what they could do. They could also hire independent promoters if they wanted to, which in my case, they didn't want it. We had an unusual thing with the Friends of Distinction because they were a pop black act. And I think I've told you before that Grazing in the Grass and Going in Circles were not allowed to be put up for Grammys in the R&B category because they had such huge pop success. Now that changed a few years later when Hall & Oates, a white act, was nominated in the R&B category, but we were barred. But nobody had heard quite what the Friends of Distinction did. It wasn't as sweet as the Fifth Dimension, and yet it wasn't nearly as funky as any of the R&B stuff. So radio didn't know what to do with it. And eventually Pat McMahon, my friend from Arizona, program director of KRIZ, thank you, Pat, broke the record for us out of nowhere. He was the first major station to play it. And that was here in my hometown. Yeah. But in essence, you handed over your product to sales and promotion. And uh, I know the, the uh, Los Angeles promotion guy for RCA came by my office one day and said, sorry, Grazing in the Grass has been out for five months and nothing's happening on it. I think it's a good record, but I think you better get the next one ready. That record went number three in the nation and was gold. Same thing happened with going in circles. Out several months, didn't do anything, went gold. Okay, without an independent promotion, this is fairly stunning. This is grassroots stuff. And same thing with Rock the Boat. There was no independent promotion, only because that dance club in New Jersey started playing it. Did the album get, quote, promoted, unquote, but it really wasn't that. It promoted itself. New York Radio heard it and said, oh, well, you hear this is a big hit in New Jersey, and boom, all of a sudden we have a number one record in the country. But back to the A&R function. Okay, once you've handed your product off to sales and promotion, you're totally on your own. So guess what you have to do next? You do, you do it all over again with somebody else, with another act. Okay, I remember that I was so exhausted because I had done two albums simultaneously on artists at the time as, a, as an A&R man for RCA, and I slept in one morning. And Joe Reisman, my boss, called me and said, where are you? And I said, I'm sleeping. And he said, we don't pay you to sleep. And I said, Joe, I've been working 18 hour days for two, three months. And he said, I don't care, get back in here. You have your desk job to do. He was right, and I did. And uh, shortly thereafter, I took a vacation. That was the smart thing to do. Take two weeks off, get the hell out of there so that you can kind of regroup and refresh. Oh my, this is an insert. This is actually recorded a day after I did the rest of this clip, but I forgot to tell you something. And it's a nice, interesting little bit of trivia. Another function that the A&R man did, let's say at RCA, but at the major labels, is once a year, we would meet in New York for a national convention. At the convention, the creative staffs of Nashville, Los Angeles, and New York RCA would meet in a conference room and decide which artists to continue with and which to drop. But at the 1969 convention, an amazing decision was reached, and that was we were going to back out of the area of middle of the road singers. These are the big Las Vegas stars. They had their own TV shows. They were national names. They were important presences for a long, 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 long time. But current music, including rock, was selling so much more than these artists that the label decided it just wasn't worth the effort and the money to continue with artists who were selling basically 
40,000 albums at a pop. Okay, I was the only dissenter in that room because I really felt it was a matter of image and let's keep some of our, quote, stars, unquote, even though they weren't big selling stars anymore, there was a substantial, oh, prestige element to keeping them. But I was overruled. I think I was the only dissenter in the room that wanted to retain these folks. Now, you'll, you'll probably... Now, you'll probably find it even more interesting that at the same time, Columbia Records refused to do that. So they stuck with Barbara Streisand, Tony Bennett, Percy Faith, Vicki Carr, on and on and on. They decided to continue their record careers, not RCA. And other labels followed RCA's lead. So, for instance, Sammy Davis, I believe he was on MGM. I remember his being on The Tonight Show saying, I can't get a label deal. Well, yeah, we kind of started a trend that these folks were on their way out, which they were, but oh my, it was sad to see them go. And the last bit of trivia is that most of these, or a bunch of these artists, started their own labels, spent their own money to record, press, manufacture, distribute their own product, because really nobody wanted them anymore other than Columbia Records, who wasn't going to add any more in that genre, but they were certainly going to be loyal to these fabulous artists who had been so successful to them over the years. And so they alone, they alone retained the middle of the road singers. Okay, that's it. Let's go back to the main body of the clip. So let's get back to A&R versus Independent. Independent, you had to be uh, a good businessman, you had to be a good social animal, and you had to be a good producer. I really only had the, well, I was a pretty good producer. That was it. Uh, and as I've mentioned before, uh, Rock the Boat, which was number one, enabled me to get instant phone calls of mine taken by record executives for 90 days, 90 days. After that, no, no, no. They, they'd either pick up the phone or they wouldn't. And they all knew me because I had been, I don't know, I had had chart records on seven different labels, seven different power structures for uh, several years. And all of these guys knew me by this point. But here we go, as an independent, you're not a home builder you're a specialty plumber. Okay, the specialty plumber means you are the hottest new plumber on the block and you can do things that apparently nobody else can do because you're just so damn good at the moment. So, yes, you have to do some of the same things that I listed that an A&R guy does, minus the desk job. Okay, but other than that, you've got to be hot. I always figured that my resume of chart records on seven different labels would be enough to carry me as an independent producer. No, what that did was qualify me to be a staff producer. That qualified me at the top rung of being a staff producer, not a head of A&R like uh, David Kirschenbaum because I couldn't administrate uh, myself out of a paper bag. He could. But uh, so there's the difference. There's the difference. The A&R man was a dying breed. It was replaced by independent production. Yes, there were staff producers still around, <laughs> including the SAE and elite of all staff producers at Warner Brothers Records. Now, I will tell you that even though my style of music was not a fit for Warner Brothers Records, I as a human being was not a fit to work at Warner Brothers Records. But I'll tell you, there was always a little bit of envy when I saw one of their staff producers pull up and their chauffeur opened the door for them because they had just driven down from their home in Montecito to show up for work that day. And I thought, wait a minute. As a staff producer at RCA, I was making eight tenths of 1% of gross record sales. I'm sorry, net record sales as a royalty. That equates two gold records in a row, two million dollars in a row. I got $19,000 in royalties 
threatened to audit, so they gave me a couple grand more, but very, very little. Okay, Rock the Boat changed that. Rock the Boat made me some significant dollars. But as Eddie Rosenblatt once told me, he said, John, had you had your hits on our label, you'd be retired by now. And he may, he, he may have been right, but I wouldn't take a moment of my RCA A&R days back. Do I miss office hours? No. Do I miss all those clerical functions and uh, having to meet and greet at the office all the time? No. But I do miss the family. There was my handful of people that I worked right alongside at RCA. They were my second family. And I'll never forget Rick Gerard pulling a joke on me one day, and I'll wrap it up with this. He called inter office on my phone and said, John, Jimmy Hilton, producer over at Warner Brothers, is just, uh, you've been playing your Grayson in the Grass to other guys, like the song pluggers here in town, showing them what the Friends of Distinction are like. He said, Jimmy Hilton's just gone in and cut Grayson in the Grass. That's gonna show you. I mean, what if, what if, what if they come out and they do better with theirs? I mean, you tell, what are you doing? Don't play anything for anybody. And then he laughed and said it was all a joke, but it was a lesson to teach me, to teach me not to show my product to anyone until it was released. And that's what a family's for. A family's gonna call you on your stuff. And I remember when uh, we had our uh, meeting with the New York brass over the new royalty plan. They asked for a show of hands and I raised my hand saying, oh, that sounds just great. And Rick walked me outside at the end of the meeting and said, John, do you realize that you just approved eight tenths of 1% as our royalty rate? That is the lowest rate in the entire industry. And I said, yeah, but he had these charts and these graphs and, and it was the president of the label and he really sounded like he was talking. It really sounded like he knew what he was talking about. He said, John, pause. If you need help, come to your boss, Joe Reisman, or come to me but you're a youngster, you are a young a and man in a small little family here, and we can help. I miss that. Okay, I've been on the road for 30, 40 years uh, with technical skills stuff and authoring stuff related to technical skills, and I wouldn't trade that for the world. It's a more humble position than a record producer, and I'm working with people who basically are just ordinary Americans working on the street, no celebrities, no anything. They're just the guy that you either meet at the store or lives next door to you. And I wouldn't trade that for the world either. Would I rather be back in the music business? No, I'd rather be exactly where I am. Okay, I hope you're all healthy and well, and thanks for sticking with me on this. If you have any input whatsoever, list it here, and I'll get back to you, okay? Now you take care. Thanks.